It's 60 tonnes of high-tech military hardware. In an hour, the Challenger tank is at battle stations with those who crew this metal monster. Now, taking us into Christmas Eve, ABBA's Nazi Secret. Germany in the 1930s, the cradle of Nazism. As Hitler prepared to dominate Europe, he nursed a dream, the of nation of a master race. Ten years later, the innocent victims of Hitler's monstrous plan began to reap the whirlwind he had sown. Only now can we reveal the part one country, Norway, played in their suffering. Frieda Lingstadt, singer with the world-famous pop group ABBA, was just one of those whose lives were turned upside down by the fallout from Hitler's great experiment. Few lives remained untouched as the Nazi military machine swept across Europe. Even when the nightmare was over, the after-effects took years to fade. For 10,000 babies born in wartime Norway, Hitler's legacy was to dominate their entire lives. For them, it was as if the war had never ended. As children, they were part of the biggest eugenics experiment the world has ever seen. For years, they suffered in silence. I was put in a mental institution because I had a German father. When I was seven, I had to ask my mother what German whore meant, because that's what they called me at school. I was sexually abused in a children's home because I had a German father. These people suffered because of events generated long before their birth. Their story reaches back to the 1930s, when Adolf Hitler's preoccupation with racial purity was growing into an obsession. In 1935 at Nuremberg, Hitler translated his theories into law. From that day on, Germany was subject to a program of racial selection based upon the belief that Aryans were genetically superior. Rassenprüfer, or race examiners, were trained to measure and assess racial purity. Their specifications were precise. Long head, narrow face, well-defined chin, soft fair hair, blue or grey eyes, pink white skin. With strict selective breeding, Hitler expected all racial impurities to be eradicated in two generations. To hasten the growth of the master race, there were incentives for those pronounced suitable to reproduce. Women were expected to have at least four children for the Führer. If they did, they were rewarded with a medal, the Mother Cross. Hitler chose SS chief Heinrich Himmler, himself an enthusiastic supporter of the master race theory, to implement his policy. He set up special homes where racially approved women could give birth to their children. They were called Lebensborn homes, Lebensborn meaning fountain of life. Helmi Ziegler was a nurse who looked after the women and children at the Lebensborn home in Friesland, northeast Germany. Soldiers and members of the SS were told to father children in order to invigorate the Nordic race. That was very important to them. The mothers who came here had to bring their documents to prove there were no impurities in their family tree, back as far as their grandparents. Himmler ordered the supposedly pure men of the SS 
to father as many children as possible, not only with their wives, but with any suitable Aryan woman. Helmi Ziegler remembers the effect this had on the men. The director of the home was an SS sergeant. He told me, with my figure and my Nordic looks, I should have a baby myself. And if I didn't have a partner, he would be happy to perform that service for me too. Helmi refused his offer, but thousands of women did decide to enter the Lebensborn program. At the homes, they were rewarded with the best medical care. Then they could either take their children home or leave them to be adopted later into an SS family. Himmler took a great personal interest in the well-being of the future master race. Under his imaginative stewardship, Lebensborn became a quasi-religious organization with its own rituals. Well, yeah, I have for example, a with erlebt. Once I took part in a naming ceremony, or baptism. An SS division came from Bremen to celebrate it. One of them held a dagger on the tummy of the baby and said, your name is Heiko, bear your name with pride, or something like that. Afterwards, they sang songs, songs of the fatherland. And then there was a big party. There was a sinister urgency to the Lebensborn project. For the other arm of Hitler's racial purity policy was the eradication of those he considered racially undesirable, Jews, gypsies and many others. They were to be replaced by the pure Lebensborn. But the scale of the Holocaust deaths was so vast that the numbers of new approved babies simply couldn't keep pace. The program needed to expand. Hitler's army had been rampaging through Europe for over a year. By 1940, he'd set his sights on Norway. The German Navy took on the British fleet in the North Sea, while the Luftwaffe attacked British and Norwegian forces on the ground. Before long, the unstoppable German war machine had moved in, and Norway had become yet another outpost of the Third Reich. The Germans originally wanted Norway for its iron ore, but what turned out to be irresistible were the genes of the people themselves, about as purely Aryan as it was possible to get. The local population was all but swamped by an occupying force of nearly half a million. Young German soldiers were everywhere. They were outgoing and apparently making an effort to fit in with the locals. Their presence turned village life upside down. The Germans occupied the houses and their uh, physical contact with the Norwegians was very close and there was absolutely no way of escaping this contact for the, for the Norwegians. If you take a small village where maybe uh, in a population of 40 people, maybe there was four or five young girls from 16 to 18 years, 20 years, and suddenly Suddenly, uh, 400 Germ Germans came, German soldiers came. It was very, very difficult to avoid that, that some of these girls and some of these Germans became uh, lovers in, in some way or another. Agnes Jensen was one of those girls. She wasn't surprised that the local girls found the German soldiers attractive. You see, Norwegian men couldn't take us to the cinema or anything because there was a lot of unemployment, so we didn't get asked out. But the Germans used to have parties in their barracks. Not that I went to any of them, but they had a lot of fun. Norwegians didn't have many opportunities for fun because they didn't have jobs. It wasn't that the Norwegians weren't handsome enough. 
It's true the uniforms were attractive. To be honest, a lot of it was that we thought they were really handsome in their uniforms. That's the main reason we went out with them. Agnes was not the only young Norwegian woman to fall for a German uniform. In other occupied countries, German soldiers were forbidden to make friends with the locals. But in Norway, soldiers were urged to take local lovers as a patriotic duty. The genetic opportunities for the master race were too good to miss. In the far north of Norway, in a small town called Ballingen, a young officer called Alfred Haase was stationed at the German garrison. He was married with a young wife and child waiting for him back home. Alfred was young but ambitious. He'd already risen to captain. On the road leading to his barracks, Alfred daily passed the home of a 19-year-old girl called Sinny Lingstad. Lots of Alfred's friends had noticed Sinny, but only he had the courage to approach her. She was nervous of him at first. He was an enemy soldier, and local feelings against the Nazis ran high. But he was polite and persistent in his advances. Before long, Sinny had fallen madly in love with Alfred. He told me a little bit about the story in Norway because it was, of course, uh, hard to believe. But he said he met this uh, woman, he was uh, uh, stationed there with his troops and he always walked past that house and he saw her in the garden. And uh, so they got to know each other and they spoke to each other and uh, he was uh, very keen on her. She was a nice looking girl and so on. And so they somehow started and they fell in love. Sinny's childhood friend, Sara Mura, remembers that Sinny was so much in love, she didn't think of Alfred as an enemy soldier. We didn't call him Alfred. We called him Fred. Sinny always talked about Fred. She talked about him as her one and only lifelong boyfriend, and also as a good friend. But Sinny's family was less than happy. I think Sinny's family didn't really like the relationship she was having with Alfred. I think they felt that it was totally inappropriate and potentially dangerous for her as well, because you know, at, at some point, people must have realized, well, you know, the Germans are not going to win this war, and who knows what's going to happen when they all have to go back to Germany, and Sin is still living there, and everyone knows that she's ha been having, you know, uh, this relationship with the German soldiers. So I think they feared for her. Alfred and Sinny were lovers for almost two years. Then Alfred was transferred away from Ballingen and the lovers were parted. Four months later, he was posted back to Germany. Before he left, he made one last effort to see Sinny. So he said to himself, I cannot just go because, uh, you know, I leave her here and she doesn't know what happens. So he uh, rented an old bicycle it was snowing, it was ice, and 30 to 40 kilometers he, you know, biked to that, back to that house. That was the night when Frida was actually made. This was to be the last time Alfred saw Sinny Lingstad. Neither knew that their last night together had left Sinny pregnant. Nine months later, she gave birth to a baby girl. She named her Annie Fried, but she was to become better known to the world as Frida, singer in the iconic Swedish band ABBA. But Frida was not Swedish, and her father was a Nazi officer. The romance between Frida's parents was fated to end in tears. All across wartime Norway, the stage was being set for the peacetime tragedy yet to come.
for Frieda was certainly not alone. So many babies were born to German soldiers and their Norwegian lovers that within a year of the occupation, the time was ripe for some new arrangements. The Germans were poised to harvest the latest recruits to the master race plan. Kora Olsen, an historian working in the state archives in Oslo, has discovered evidence of the plans. In uh, December 1940, to the um, Reichsführer SS, also Himmler in Berlin, about um, children born out of wedlock in Norway uh, with the German fathers. A uh, letter of um, four pages uh, SS in Norway suggests that there should be uh, established a uh, German um, um, Entbindungsheimen, also uh, institutions for birth, and uh, that should be uh, from Lebensborn. Himmler agreed with the plan, and in March 41, the Lebensborn were was established in uh, Norway. When Agnes Jensen became pregnant by her German lover, the Nazis were immediately interested in her unborn child. When I became pregnant, I got a letter saying I could give birth in a home in Oslo where there were only Germans and German babies. It was run by the Germans. You could have your baby there and they would sit around a big table and ask you if you wanted your child or if you wanted them to take it. I said I wanted to take my child home. I have heard that they wanted to create a pure race, but we didn't think about that. We were just young, stupid and in love. We didn't think anything about a pure race. That was in Germany they were thinking about that. Pure race, what does that mean? We didn't think about it. For the young Norwegian mothers, this may just have been a convenient place to give birth to an illegitimate child, away from the disapproval of family and neighbours. For the Nazi authorities, it was the cornerstone of their eugenic policy. When a Norwegian woman came to a doctor, and it was uh, stated that she was pregnant. The father was a German soldier. The case should be handed over to Lebensborn. And um, then she had to fill out uh, all formulas with information about her parents and grandparents. The Lebensborn project was a great success. The babies just kept coming. By the end of the war, there were 10,000 of them almost all of whom were officially registered in the project's files. The Lebensborn buildings are still there. Paul Hansen and Tove Lila Strunt were born in this one, Gotthard, a few miles outside Oslo. Today, Gotthard is a nursing home. When the Germans were there, it was well equipped and staffed by German nurses. The babies selected for the master race were to be well looked after. That is of little consolation to them today. We were so young. So stupid. So stupid. Yeah, we were only little. They were strange times. The awful thing is that we never seem to be able to get rid of the stigma. We'll never be rid of it. 
Not until we're dead and buried. I don't want to be buried in a grave. I want my ashes to be scattered to the winds. At least then we won't be picked on anymore. The files on the Lebensborn kept during the Nazi occupation of Norway are now stored in the National Archives in Oslo. The Nazis kept a file on every child they knew to have been born to a German father. They kept detailed records of the medical history and racial background of the parents and reports on the progress of their 8,905 prized offspring. Gert Fleischer has only vague memories of her father, but hopes to learn more about her place in the Lebensborn project by examining her file. This is my birth certificate. And there is my Levensborn number, 2620. That was the 17th of September, 42, up in the north. Here is the Gesundheitsnachweis, a medical check my mother had to go through. It says that she is one meter and 69 centimeter high. She weighs 69 kilos. Color of hair is uh, dark blonde. Color of skin, ivory. Color of eyes, gray. Her hair, straight. Racial questions, then they conclude be Nordish and Lapish, and so on and so on. And they conclude with it says it's not desire, desirable that she has children in the society, uh, the German society, of course, the three, Third Reich, because she has this lapish blood. blood. To have a file here, in the Le a Lebensborn file, uh, it's an offence because uh, it's a file established uh, on the basis on, of um, genetical hygiene, race hygiene, as the German said, and it goes against everything I believe in. And to find myself in such a file is a huge offence. Gert was rejected by the Germans because she had lap blood but she and thousands of other Lebensborn children were soon to face a far worse fate in Norway because of their German blood. From Russia in the east... By 1945, the Germans were on the brink of defeat. It became clear that they would soon be forced to withdraw from Norway. The Norwegian government in exile broadcast warnings to collaborators. We have previously issued a warning, and we repeat it here, of the price these women will pay for the rest of their lives. They will be held in contempt by all Norwegians for their lack of restraint. In May 1945, the Germans surrendered. Himmler committed suicide, and the Lebensborn project came abruptly to an end. King Haakon and his government return to Norway. A parade through the streets of Oslo marks the event. Norway rejoiced as the war ended and the king returned from exile in London. But for the women who had taken German lovers, retribution was at hand. Collaborationists are paid off in full measure for consorting with the enemy. As in other European countries, 
women who had slept with German soldiers received harsh treatment when the war was over. Public humiliation is, in reality, mild punishment for traitors. Agnes Jensen watched and waited in fear as the women were taken away. They put them on the back of a truck by the railway. When they were on the truck, they would spit on them, hit them, cut their hair off, do whatever they wanted to them. After the war, they were sent to a school building that the Germans had been occupying. They kept them under guard so they could do whatever they wanted to them, rape them, whatever they wanted. The government did little to discourage the attacks. It was the beginning of a far-reaching campaign of revenge. I think there was a feeling uh, this was allowed. This was really allowed. And um, I think that some places in, in Norway you will also find that the local resistance uh, groups were, were actually uh, doing this maltreatment of women themselves in the belief that this was... Uh, although not spoken, it was un unofficially uh, the policy of the government. Collaborators had a hard time all over Europe, but in Norway the hatred extended to their children. One has to understand the ambience after the war in Norway. The, the whole Norway hated the Germans um, so much that um, it wa was almost... Um, too much to ask of them to accept somebody like me. Child of the enemy. Child of the hated. Det som var det värste för mig, det var det som skedde i hemmet. The worst for me was what happened at home. The physical and psychological violence. Imagine your own mother calling you a bloody German pig. I remember not long before I actually left home. I was physically stronger by then. I told my mother they could beat me as much as they wanted, but please would they not call me that. Frida's mother struggled to bring up her child. There was no escaping the anger of their neighbors. Everybody in Ballingen knew that Frida's father was a German soldier. Mother and child were ostracized by the community. Ksini's mother felt that this is not a good place for, for my granddaughter, which was Frida, obviously, to, to grow up. So she decided that, you know, we're going to Sweden because that's a safe environment and we can start a new life and no one knows who we are and all that. And eventually they ended up in a place called Torshella. And soon after they'd arrived there, Frida's mother, Sinny, she came after. And she actually got a job there, and uh, things were sort of looking up. But, but then something happened. One day she just collapsed at home. And she was rushed to, the hos rushed to the hospital, and it turned out that there was some problem with her kidneys. And there was surgery and, and all that, but uh, it turned out that her life couldn't be saved. I 
It was awful. And I thought of Anifred, that she should lose her mother. She was only a little girl when her mother died. She didn't understand anything about what was happening. And I think that was what we thought about most, that little Anifred had lost her mother. Frida was motherless, but she was at least safe in Sweden. For the Lebensborn children left behind in Norway, there was to be no escape. It wasn't just that they were hated as a reminder of the Nazi occupation. It was also widely believed, with a logic worthy of the Nazis themselves, that their German blood was defective and would make them fascist by nature. The Norwegian government wanted to deport the children to Germany, but this plan was vetoed by the Allies. A committee was set up. It asked for the opinion of Ernolf Erdegaard, the country's leading psychiatrist. Erdegaard actually it diagnosed the group of about 10,000 mothers and 10,000 children. He said that a large proportion of these people, they must be said to carry bad genes. Actually, they were more or less to be labeled mentally retarded. So with a German soldier as a father and an unmarried mother, these children were genetically very bad and they belonged in, uh, yes, in special institutions for the mentally retarded or feeble-minded. In a staggering act of retribution, hundreds of small, healthy children were then forcibly incarcerated in mental institutions. Raidun Muking was just two years old when she was taken from the Lebensborn home where she was born and sent to Emma Yot, an institution for the mentally ill. Emma Yot is now a music school for children with special needs but it holds haunting memories for Raidun. I was very scared, so I cried, but the nurses didn't come. They just sat there in the staff room and, and couldn't be bothered to come and talk to me. I must have cried all night. The next evening, when the night shift arrived, I was punished. They put me in a straitjacket with my arms tied behind my back. For three years, Raidun spent every night in a straitjacket. When I look at this room, I feel that I shouldn't have been here. I shouldn't have been wrongly sent to M.I. Yort. That if things had been different, I could have gone home and been brought up by my mother. Paul Hansen spent his childhood locked up in M.I. Yort, condemned for having a German father. He remembers the shock of arriving there. They were always lying in their beds, multi-handicapped they call it nowadays. They were ill, and I thought, fancy us who are healthy having to be here with them. But the worst was that we had to go on the potty and eat in the same room and the screaming at night. The screaming, that was the worst thing of all. Paul is bitter about the way the Lebensborn families were treated by their government. 
Our mothers got punished more severely than the worst Nazis. The Nazis got off more lightly. Our mothers are still being punished today. I think it was a rotten, stinking conspiracy against both our mothers and their children. That's how I feel. It's so damned unfair. It shouldn't happen. And to think that Norway is supposed to be such a perfect country. Arnatine Lingstadt was determined that her granddaughter Frida's life would not be ruined. In Sweden, nobody knew that Frida's father was a German soldier. But while life in the sleepy town of Torshalla was safe, Frida's childhood was far from ideal. With her mother dead and her father missing on the trip back to Germany, Frida was an orphan. Torshella was a, a very, very small place. Nothing was really happening. It was Dullsville, basically. And Frida was kind of a lonely child anyway. But she discovered music. And I think that was what saved her. She started singing with, with a jazz band. And uh, that's where her, sort of musical, her professional musical career started. And she was only like 13 years old or something at the time. By the time she was 17, Frida was a mother herself but her career had stalled in the small town. Reluctantly, she decided to leave her family. I think it obviously was a difficult decision for Frida to leave her children behind, but at the same time, she was so emotionally unfulfilled at the time. She, I mean, she didn't really have a, a, a real childhood. She had to grow up much earlier than most children, and she was still searching for some kind of fulfillment. And the, I think her ambition was her, the, her version of emotional fulfillment at the time. That was the only thing she could find that could really give her a uh, you know, good um, uh, emotional payoff, was to sing and to meet the audience and, and, and have a good career and advance her career. Frida soon caught the eye of veteran Swedish cabaret artist Charlie Norman, joining his popular show in 1969. She was a uh, talker of the town among musicians. The, all the musicians like her singing. The guys in the band said, let's try that girl from Eskilstuna. She was. We loved her because uh, nice, friendly, uh, good ear, a lot of laughs. Uh, nah, she was, uh, ah, she was wonderful. But despite the newfound success, Frida still seems to be struggling with her past. She was shy and, and timid. Uh, when there's a lot of people around, and uh, she was not so fond that time to be on stage and to have a lot of people looking at her. She, I think, she preferred studio. You know. But as I remember it, she was not talking so much about herself, especially not if it's. Uh, what you call kind of trouble or something. You don't mention, no. Nobody in her new life knew about her German father and her flight from Norway. By 1974, Frida was poised for international stardom. Her band, ABBA, had triumphed in the Eurovision Song Contest. Their win catapulted ABBA and Frida to fame and an unexpected twist of fate. At the height of their fame, journalist Harry Edgington was commissioned to write a biography of the band. It was the first time anyone had looked behind the scenes. At that time, they were certainly the biggest pop group since the Beatles, and they were selling in numbers in some countries that even the Beatles had never sold in places like Australia 
certain countries in Europe. They were just a worldwide phenomenon. Nothing got out about their earlier life. So they would be presented as the um, four smiling perfect Swedes. While researching his book about ABBA, Harry uncovered Frida's secret, that her father had been a German soldier believed dead at the end of the war. The story was picked up by Bravo, a German pop magazine. A little girl who was a reader of this magazine um, read the story about this man and about Frida and um, she said, well, my uncle is Alfred Hase. He wouldn't be the one, would he? <laughs> the girl and her father spoke to Alfred Hase about the story. Alfred Hase was shocked. He asked his brother, how, how do you know her? Well, yes, I know her. I met her when I was in Norway. And uh, brother said, congratulations, you are the father of a very, very famous singer, one of ABBA, Frida. The news came as a shock to Alfred, who claims he didn't know Cine was pregnant. It was going to be even more of a shock for Frida. The next step for Alfred, obviously, was to get in touch with his daughter. And he started phoning uh, their offices in Stockholm um, and trying to get in touch with her. And she wouldn't come to the phone. She thought it was you know, a crank caller because, obviously, as a pop star, you attract all kinds of people. You need to know that that was the time, 1977, when ABBA was like absolutely super, super duper stars everywhere in the world. We phoned up the office uh, of ABBA and told them, and they were, of course, very careful with it and shocked because, um, you know, anybody could come along and say, well, I'm Alfred Hase. But um, it turned out that he knew things about her mother and he knew things about the circumstances in, in Balang and that he, he, you know, he couldn't have known that unless he, he really knew Sini Lindstad. Frida was uncertain and asked him to fly to Stockholm to see her. The meeting convinced her that Alfred really was the father she thought was dead. Next day Frida called me and she said, Booby, I tell you, it's really true, he is my father because he knows all the details. We made photos and you can even tell when you, when you see us from the side um, that we have the same profile. His nose is mine, my nose is his. It was very very moving. I can imagine that, uh, that uh, Alfred Hase, as a family man, um, wished to have his daughter, his newfound daughter, uh, uh, involve her into the family as well. And uh, sure, why shouldn't she be home for Christmas? But obviously that wasn't the case, especially uh, Frida has lived her life until then, until she was 35, and now she meets her father. And in the beginning, of, of course, it is very emotional, but then everybody goes back to normal. Everybody goes back to their lives. After 50 years of silence, a group of 122 Lebensborn children have started legal proceedings against the Norwegian government. They are asking for recognition for the abuses they have suffered. They've hired a lawyer, Randi Spiedefold, to represent them. She has selected seven of their claims to bring as a test case. But the cases have proved more of a personal challenge than she first imagined. The hardest part was in the beginning, when I heard the stories. I heard uh, grown-up uh, adults, uh, women and men, crying here, uh, telling their story in detail for the first time. Uh, they dared to open the, well they had to open themselves and they had to tell me because I had to uh, uh, hear the story. The Lebensborn are asking for compensation and an official apology for the wrongs that have been done to them. Of course there is no way of repairing a ruined life. But an apology and an economical compensation would help a lot of us live a little bit 
easier life in their old age. At the first hearing, the Oslo City Court ruled against them. The next step was to take the case to the appeal court. The government lawyer argues that it all happened too long ago for the government to be held responsible. The hearing lasted four days, but the judge ruled in favour of the government and the group's case was thrown out yet again. They are really getting in a fighting mood now. Even though the cases turn out to be, uh, take a long time, they waited so long time, it doesn't matter. But they want it now, and they want it before they are getting too old. For Rundi, there's a hypocrisy at the heart of Norway, the home of the Nobel Peace Prize, a country that prides itself on resolving conflicts around the world, refusing to acknowledge its own victims of war. I'm very disappointed and I'm embarrassed. I'm very embarrassed on behalf of my country. I, I thought that Norway uh, was the great country in human rights, the best country. And I didn't uh, disbelieve that at one moment before I took this case. The legal case failed on a point of law. But now the Norwegian government has finally agreed in principle to compensate the Lebensborn children. For Gert, Frida's own story shows how hard it has been to struggle against the tide of rejection. She was a member of ABBA. She was, everybody loved her all around the world. She should have been strong enough to be able to come forward and say, I'm a German child. Not even she dared. That tells something about the oppression and the shame that was brought up upon us. Frida was lucky enough to escape the fate of the other Norwegian Lebensborn. But the publicity-shy ABBA star has shunned the public debate now raging in Norway. After their first optimistic meetings, Frida and her father are no longer in regular contact. Frida Lingstad now lives alone and is rarely seen in public. After the break, the sight and sound of some impressive heavy metal when 